modifiers in Compose can be chained, and the order in which we do so matters. But how exactly does it matter? In this episode, we'll go beyond your intuition and learn to reason about modifier chaining and how it influences the sizes of our composables. In the previous episode, we looked at the three phases of transforming data into UI, composition, layout, and drawing. We also learned how modifiers can affect different phases. We used the size, padding, and clip modifiers to change the size, spacing, and shape of a composable. In this episode, I'd like to zoom in a little bit more on the layout phase. Because when we start chaining more modifiers that influence a layout node's measurements, and specifically when we start combining them, it can be difficult to understand what the results will actually be. Let's take a look at some use cases. Let's say we draw an image and apply this modifier chain. What is the image going to look like? Will it fill the whole screen, like option A at the top? Or will it limit itself to 50 dp, like option B? Now let's say we add a modifier wrap content size in the middle. What would the impact of that be? Or what if we use this modifier chain for the image, clipping the image, adding some padding, and then setting its size? Would this result in a nice round image, like option A? Or would the image be cut off on the sides, like option B? If you don't know the answers to these questions yet, don't worry. In about 10 minutes, you'll be ready to answer these and any other layout questions people might throw at you. How, you say? By learning about constraints. Remember that in the last episode, we discussed the layout phase and how it follows a three-step algorithm to find each layout node's width, height, and XY coordinates. Constraints help finding the right sizes for our nodes during the first two steps of this algorithm. Constraints are minimum and maximum bounds for a node's width and height. When the node decides on its size, its measured size should fall in this given size range. Constraints are passed down from parent to child in the UI tree during the layout phase. When a parent node measures its children, it provides these constraints to each child to let them know how big or small they're allowed to be. Constraints can be bounded, indicating a minimum and a maximum width and height. In this case, the layout node should choose a width between 100 and 300 dp and a height between 100 and 200. Constraints can also be unbounded, in which case the node is not constrained to any size. The maximum width and height bounds are then set to infinity. Or constraints can be exact, asking the node to follow an exact size requirement. The minimum and maximum bounds are set to the same value, in this case 300 by 200 dp. Of course, combinations of these are also valid. For example, bounding the width while allowing for an unbounded maximum height, or setting an exact width but providing a bounded height. As I said, constraints are passed down from parent to child node in the UI tree, when the parent is going to measure its child. When a node has decided its own size, it communicates that size back up the tree. Let's see how this works for our UI tree. Say we're rendering this row inside a container that is 300 by 200 dp. The constraints passed to our row node are bounded and say that it can take any width between 0 and 300 and any height between 0 and 200. To decide the size it actually wants to occupy, the row will measure its children. It forwards the same constraints to its first child. The clip modifier does not impact measurement, so it simply forwards the constraints to the next modifier. The size modifier is used to specify an exact size. It changes the constraints to be exact bounds, in this case, bounds of 40 by 40 dp. As the image node does not have any children, it will decide its own size, based on the constraints that were passed in. It will listen to the changed constraints, and it will report a size of 40 by 40 dp. The size modifier does not change that measured size, and neither does the clip modifier. Now the row wants to place its children side by side, so it should adapt the constraints to make sure that its second child does not go out of bounds. It subtracts 40 dB from the maximum width constraint. The padding modifier now wants to add 10 dB of space at the start of its child, so it decreases the max width constraint by a further 10 dB to 250. To decide its size, the column needs to measure its children. It first forwards the constraints to its first child. This padding modifier 
will add vertical bedding. So it decreases the maximum height by 5 dB to 195. The text decides its own size and reports a size of 140 by 15. The bedding modifier increases that size, as the bedding should be incorporated in the text element. It reports a size of 140 by 20. Now remember the column originally had maximum bounds of 250 by 200. Because a column places its children below each other, the maximum height constraints passed to the second child is decreased by the height of the first child, in this case 20 dB, so it becomes 180. The second text reports a size of 100 by 15 dB, so now the column knows enough to decide on its size. It picks the maximum width of its children and the sum of their heights, and it reports a size of 140 by 35. The column's star padding adds another 10 dp to the reported width, and now the row can decide how big it wants to be. It takes the sum of its children's widths and the maximum of their heights. This resolves to a total size of 190 by 40. By now, you should have a good understanding of how constraints affect the size of composables and how modifiers affect those constraints. Let's take a closer look at some modifiers and how they adapt constraints. We can start with a simple size modifier that adapts constraints to fixed minimum and maximum values. In this case, the constraints going in are quite flexible, allowing widths between 0 and 300 and heights between 0 and 200. The size modifier changes those constraints to fixed width and height of 40 before forwarding to its child. But what if the size you pass falls outside of the constraints that were passed in? So for example, let's say we pass a size modifier of 400 dB. In that case, the size modifier will try to match the past constraints as closely as it can. It will still listen to the constraints passed in and not override them. In this case, even though the modifier specifies a size of 400 by 400, the resulting exact constraints will be 300 by 200. The same thing happens when the requested size is smaller than a minimum bounds. The constraints will be adapted to the lowest possible values, while still adhering to the constraints passed in. This also explains why chaining multiple size modifiers doesn't do anything. The first size modifier will set both the minimum and maximum bounds to a fixed value. And even though the second size modifier requests a size of 50 dB, it has to adhere to the minimum bound values that were passed to it so it will still resolve to a size of 100 dB. If you really don't want your node to adhere to the incoming constraints, you can replace a size modifier with another modifier called required size. It will override the incoming constraints and it will pass the size that you specify, in this case 50 dB. When passing the size back up the tree, it will reset the reported size to the incoming constraints, here 100 by 100 dB. The child node will then be centered in that available space. Now keep in mind that instead of using the size modifier that adapts both width and height, we can also use the width modifier to set a fixed width but leave the height undecided, or we can use the height modifier to set a fixed height but leave the width undecided. Or we can even use the size in modifier for even more fine-grained control. You can then specify the minimum and maximum width and height individually. Now that we learned about constraints and how they influence measurements, let's return to our original use cases and find the right solutions. This image composable applies the fill max size and the size modifier, which means it results in a layout node that looks like this. Let's say the incoming constraints are that the image can be anywhere up to 300 in width and up to 200 dB in height. The fill max size modifier changes the constraints to set both the width and the height to the maximum value passed in, 300 dB in width and 200 dB in height. So even though the size modifier wants to use a size of 50 by 50 dB, it still needs to adhere to these incoming minimum constraints. And thus the size modifier will also output the exact constraint bounds of 300 by 200, effectively ignoring the value that you provided in the size modifier. The image follows these bounds and reports a size of 300 by 200, which is passed all the way up. And so we can see that the right answer was option A. Now, what would happen when we add a wrap content size modifier to the mix? The fill max size modifier will still behave the same. 
but the wrap content modifier resets the minimum constraints. So while fill max size resulted in fixed constraints, wrap content modifier resets it back to bounded constraints. The following node can now take up the whole space again or be smaller than that entire space. And so the size modifier sets the constraints to minimum and maximum bounds of 50. The image thus resolves to a size of 50 by 50 and the size modifier forwards that. Now the wrap content size has a special property. It takes its child and puts it in the center of the available minimum bounds that were passed to it. The size it communicates to its parents is thus equal to those minimum bounds that were passed into it. By combining just these three modifiers, we were able to define a size for our composable and center it in its parent. Option B is the right answer. And now if we look at our final example, you might already be able to solve it using the knowledge that we've gained so far. Looking at our UI tree, there's nothing new. The clip modifier does not change the constraints. The padding modifier lowers the maximum constraints. And the size modifier sets all the constraints to 100 dp. The image adheres to those constraints and it reports a size of 100 by 100 dp. The padding modifier adds 10 dp on all sizes, so it increases the reported width and height by 20 dp. Now let's see what happens when we start drawing the nodes. The clip modifier acts on a canvas of 120 by 120 dp. Thus, it creates a circle mask of that size. The padding modifier then insets its content by 10 dp on all sizes, so it lowers the canvas size to 100 by 100 dp. The image is then drawn in that canvas. You can see that the image is clipped based on the original circle of 120 dp, and thus we see this weird result. Option B was the right answer. Wow, that was a lot. You learned about constraints and used them to reason about modifiers, how to order them, and measurements. In the next episode, Simona will show you how you can use this information to start implementing your own custom layout. Thanks for watching.